let's say there is a popular page in your Rails application which has a slow loading speed and you would like to improve the performance. One of the most effective ways to do so is through caching. Now I've covered various caching techniques in the past, but one thing I haven't talked much about is where the cache is stored. Now Rails' cache store functionality is very modular. It uses the file system to store the cache by default, but you can easily swap this out to store the cache elsewhere. In fact, Rails comes with several cache store options you can choose from. Uh, the default used to be a memory store, which uh, just stores the cache in the local memory of that Ruby process. The issue with this is that in production, you often have multiple Rails instances running, and each of those would have their own separate cache store, which isn't very uh, resourceful. And then we have the file store, which will work fine for some smaller applications, but it isn't very efficient because reading and writing uh, from the disk is pretty slow. So if you're using it for a cache that you're accessing frequently, you might want to use something else. And that brings us to the memcache store, which is sort of the best of both worlds. This is meant to be used with a memcache D server, so the cache will be shared across multiple Rails instances or even separate servers. And access is very fast because it's just stored in memory. This is certainly a great option for serious caching, but I don't recommend using the memcache store that Rails includes. Instead, you should use Dolly, which is much improved and has support for some additional features such as memcached's binary protocol. Just be aware that it requires memcached 1.4 or greater to use. Now in the upcoming Rails 4 release, the built-in memcache store has been updated to use Dolly, but in the meantime, thankfully, Dolly includes its own Rails cache store which we can use directly while we're on Rails 3. Well, let's get started with this application and switch the cache store over to use memcached and Dolly. Now the first step is to install memcached. If you're on OS 10, it comes pre-installed. We can see the uh, version number here on Lion, which I'm using as 145, which is recent enough, but if you want to upgrade, I recommend using Homebrew. So I'm going to do that with brew install memcached and let it run. There we go. Next, I'll start it up manually using this command provided. Now that we have memcached running, I can set it up as the cache store for this Rails application. First, I'll go into the gem file and add in the dolly gem in there, and then you'll need to run the bundle command to install it. Next, I'll go into the config uh, development.rb file and temporarily enable caching so that we can try this out. Now, you'll probably want to set up some kind of staging environment if you want to experiment with caching extensively on your local machine. I show how to do that in episode 72. Uh, next, I'll configure the cache store and set that to the dolly store, which is provided by the gem. You'll probably want to do the same thing in your production environment config file if you're using it in production. Now let's give this a try in the console. You can see if I access the Rails cache that it is now an instance of the Dolly store. And if I try writing to it, this is just going to write directly to memcache and I can read that value back out again. Another thing we can do on Rails cache is call fetch and this will attempt to read a value and then otherwise execute the block and set it to that value. So let me show this by sleeping for one second here and then returning a value. So this is going to sleep for one second because that value did not exist in memcache, but this time it returns immediately because it was able to read it from a memcache D. Another handy method is read multi. Now this will attempt to access all the values for each of the keys passed in. So this returns a hash containing those values, and this is especially important if you're running memcache D on a separate machine across the network. So this way it only has to take one trip over the network instead of two to fetch the values. One more method that I want to show you here is stats, which is especially useful when debugging memcached. So this returns a hash of all kinds of useful data, but uh, let me output this in YAML format so it's a little clearer. So this will tell us things like the number of items stored and how many bytes are used, and also the maximum number of bytes allowed. So once it reaches this limit, it's going to overwrite the older unused caches, which is a pretty awesome feature. And also this tells us uh, how many times it reached the maximum number of connections. So you might want to keep an eye on this number here just to make sure it's not capping out on the number of connections. Now it's important to understand that memcached is not a persistent store. If I stop the process and then start it back up again, and then go back to the Rails console and try to read a value that I said earlier, you're going to see is nil because it lost its value. There are some workarounds to make the store persistent, but it's not really what memcached is designed to do. It's made for caching, so it should be no problem if that data is lost. 
Now one feature that I really like is the ability to expire a cache in a given amount of time. If we're writing a cache, we can pass in an expires in option in let's say something like five seconds. And then that means it's going to be able to read from that value, but if I wait five seconds and then read from it again, it's going to be nil. Let's take a look back at our Rails application and I wanna show you some of the different ways that we can cache the contents of this page which is listing out the products. And what specifically is cached using memcached? First of all, one of the few caching techniques which does not use the cache store is page caching. So here I am in the products controller index action. And if you wanna consider page caching, you might say caches page index, and that will still fall back to a file-based caching because it assumes that you have a web server on the front end which is going to serve that file instead of going to the Rails application which would read from memcache. So be aware of that. However, almost all other caching techniques will use the cache store. For example, let's say we have uh, HTTP caching in here, let's say expires in five minutes and set uh, public to true, so it'll be stored by rack cache. Now rack cache is going to be using the same cache store as your Rails application, so it will use memcached here. Now I cover HTTP caching further in episode 321 if you're interested. Now another type of caching is fragment caching, which is done at the view layer, and this would also be stored in memcached. So I can enable it by just calling cache and then passing in a block, and that would use uh, the current path, or I could pass in, let's say, a key in here, which would be used there. I could also pass in other options that I would pass to uh, cache.write, such as expires in, and we can set that to five minutes to uh, customize when we want the cache to expire. Really cool. Now I cover fragment caching further in episode 90, but what I wanna focus more on here is caching at a lower level. Notice on this page where I'm listing out the products, I'm displaying the category name for each one. Now a product belongs to a category, so that is a separate model that it's associated with. And you can see in the development log, there are a lot of queries being performed here to fetch the category for each of the products. Now Active Record does some caching on its own, so the performance isn't too bad, but if you wanted to cache this persistently between requests, you might do so through memcached. Now I'm going to do this caching at the model layer. So inside of the product model, currently I'm calling product category name as separate methods, but I'm going to make a single method called category name, which will return a cached version. And then going into the product model, I'll define that category name method, and I'm going to use Rails cache fetch for this, and then I'll pass in an array for the key here, so that will automatically be converted to a string a cache key by joining them with a slash. So I'll say category, and then the category ID for this product, and then the name attribute, and let's have this expires in, uh, let's say five minutes. And then I'll pass in a uh, block to this and have it return the category's name for the product, quite simple. So now the first time I load this page, it's going to uh, read from the database still because it needs to write the cache, but the second time it's going to read that category name value from memcached. And we can see that if we check out the log file, there was only one database query performed and the category names for each of the products would just fetch through the cache. Uh, so this may or may not improve performance because it is doing a read for each of the separate products and having to communicate with memcached for each one. It's always best to measure extensively when doing any kind of performance optimization like this. This is a case where you might want to use a multi-read to fetch all of the category names in one go for each of the products instead of having to communicate separately for each one, especially if you're running memcached over the network. In general, I often prefer to cache at the higher level, such as a view layer, because it often results in less chatter. However, there are advantages of caching at a lower level like this, because you can use the same cache multiple times through separate views easily. For example, I have a show template here, which lists the category name for the product as well. I can easily change this to use the category name method, and it will instantly use that same cache. No need to do separate caching in the view. So now when I visit a product page, it won't need to perform another database query to fetch the category name. So both techniques have their advantages. Uh, this is just another uh, tool to add to your caching tool belt. Now one problem is that what if the category name changes? Well, it will automatically pick up the new name within five minutes since this cache is set to expire in that amount of time. However, if you want it to be uh, picked up as the category name changes, you can do that in a callback in the category model, something like this. So after the category updates, it's going to trigger this call to Rails cache delete 
to delete that cache with the same key value, and only do that if the name attribute has actually changed. Now, if you're doing this, I recommend moving the logic uh, for this caching behavior into a class method in this category model, so that way the key logic behavior is all in the same location. Next, let me show you how you can deploy memcached into production. First, I'll SSH into the server that I already have set up, running Ubuntu 12.04. Fortunately, installation is super easy through apt-git install memcached. There we go, already installed and started. Now, if you want to configure this, you can find the configuration file at etc memcached.conf. Now, I think these default options are pretty good, but one thing you might want to change is the amount of memory that memcache uses. Uh, this defaults to 64, but you might want to bump this up if you can spare the memory. I probably wouldn't go much lower, though. Another important option is the dash L, which this is going to uh, basically only allow uh, to accept connections on the local host. Now, memcached doesn't really offer much with regards to authentication, but at least this uh, prevents the entire world from accessing it. But it's also a good idea to set up some kind of firewall to make sure that port is closed. But of course, if you're doing some kind of multi-server setup, you'll want to remove this line and handle the security elsewhere. Now, I like to set up my production server using Capistrano recipes like I show in episode 337. If you're doing this, here is a recipe file for setting up memcached. So this will automatically install it using the apt-get install command and also set up a configuration template which is provided here. So this is pretty much the same as the configuration template that's provided by default. However, I did provide a memory cache limit variable which you can configure through the recipe file here. So you can easily change this value through Ruby. And then at the end, there's just some stop, start, and restart tasks for managing the daemon. So if you're using Capistrano to manage your server, just toss this recipe file right in and it should just work. Now I have yet to mention the different configuration options that you can pass in when you set up Dolly as the cache store. The readme has a nice example here. It's probably a good idea to set up a namespace for the uh, cache keys. And you can also uh, pass in a default expiration time and enable compression, which is probably a good idea if you have a lot of large values and a limited amount of, amount of memory. Now there are a lot more other options that you can pass in here and thankfully they're nicely documented in the readme. And by the way, if you do want some kind of authentication with uh, memcached, uh, look into SASL, which you can pass in a username and password uh, through Dolly here. Now for further information on memcached, I highly recommend you check out their wiki page. I found it quite useful and well-written and it's just a nice read to go through the various topics here. Well, that's all I have for this episode on caching with Dolly and Memcached. Thanks for watching.